My mother, my mother named me Timothy Ray Brown. The media renamed me the Berlin Patient. I am the man who, the first man to be cured of HIV. I don't make this statement as an empty declaration. To be honest, I don't think I believe I actually believed it until the New England Journal of Medicine published the case report about me in February of 2009 almost two years after I was cured. There's nothing like having a respected medical journal talking about you to drive home a point. <laughs> Since being cured, I have mostly gone on quietly with my life. Some of you might think I would have shouted it from the rooftops. I've always been a pretty private person, so I was actually initially satisfied with just being cured. It wasn't until I looked at the bigger picture that I began to realize that I needed to do more than just tell my story. And this, this is why on July 24th at the 19th International AIDS Conference in Washington, D.C., I launched the Timothy Ray Brown Foundation of the World AIDS Institute. Now back to my story. By sharing it, I hope that I can bring home some new optimism to the fight against HIV and the global quest to find a cure. So how does a man from Seattle, Washington, come to be identified with a medical milestone in a city halfway around the world from his birthplace? I was attending school in Berlin in 1995 when I tested positive for HIV. My reaction was that, like that of many others who were diagnosed at the time. I was terrified. I knew people who were struggling with the disease. Some of my friends had actually died from it, had already died from it. I don't think I'd ever felt so alone as I did at that moment. It didn't help matters any that a friend of mine told me that I probably only had a couple of years to live. At the, that time, most of us viewed an HIV diagnosis as a death sentence. Cure was not a topic of discussion. I just wanted to survive. If you are familiar with the history of HIV, you know that the following year brought a new treatment that started to hold the disease in check for many of us. Combination antiretroviral therapy seemed like a miracle in 1996. Really sick people got better, people looked healthier. Over time we realized that many of us were living longer. I knew that I still had a deadly disease, but death didn't hover quite so near. I came to believe that I would remain healthy and live a pretty normal life. The next 11 years were pretty uneventful. Germany's universal health care sy system provided me treatment that most people in the world didn't have. I, also, I was also lucky that I mostly tolerated my HIV medications. I got used to the idea of a lifetime of pills. The clinics Clinics in Berlin allowed me to move HIV to a back burner. My story became commonplace for an HIV patient with access to health care. That is until 2006, when progressive fatigue resulted in a referral to an oncologist. A bone marrow biopsy showed that I had acute myeloid leukemia. You didn't have to be a specialist to know that I, that was bad news. Before I could spend much time wrestling with my mortality again, I was admitted to the University Hospital under the care of oncologist Dr. Gero Hooter, who started me on chemotherapy. Chemotherapy wanted to remind me that treatment for a deadly disease can be miserable. It mocked me. What? Protease inhibitors upset your tummy once? Well, get a load of this. I de developed pneumonia early on. I had to stop my third round of chemo therapy halfway through when I developed a sepsis infection. I could have died. Fortunately, I had some great doctors. I was released from the hospital after, after the sepsis infection. My leukemia appeared to be in remission. But there was concern that I hadn't been able to complete all of the chemotherapy. 
Dr. Uter recommended a little vacation after my treatment, so I took off for Italy. The museums and beaches of Genoa were just what the doctor ordered. In addition to providing excellent advice, Dr. Hutter had a revolutionary treatment idea. He was aware of the discussions going on in HIV research about something called CCR5 receptor mutation. The CCR5 receptor allows the HIV virus to attach to the T cell and subsequently infect the cell, spreading the disease. People without CCR5 appeared to be resistant to HIV infections, but they are rare. Only 1% of the Northern European population is this lucky. So why am I telling you this? Well, another treatment for leukemia would be to wipe out the cancerous immune system and replace it with healthy stem cells from a donor. <clears throat> Dr. Uter thought that if a stem cell transplant was necessary, why not use a compatible donor who had the CCR5 mutation? The idea was that if, if my cancerous HIV susceptible immune system was replaced with, HIV, with an HIV resistant line of stem cells, not only would my leukemia be treated, but HIV would be cleared from my body. I thought a possibility to be rid of cancer and, and HIV at the same time, who could say no to the chance to strike back at a disease that had killed some of my closest friends? Who could say no to being a part of something so groundbreaking? Who could say no? Me, that's who. <laughs> I said no. <laughs> now let me put this in perspective. When this was first proposed to me by one of Dr. Hooter's colleagues, I was still recovering from my chemotherapy. I had come close to dying. By comparison, by comparison my 11 years of HIV treatments had been a cakewalk, and stem cell transplants are very risky procedures. Did I really have to go through this extra hell? Some might call me a difficult patient. That's not true. I usually follow my doctor's advice. Remember, I did go to Italy. <laughs> In January 2007, my leukemia returned. Initial attempts at a different chemotherapy were, therapy were not successful. A stem cell transplant became a viable option. Dr. Huter screened 67 specimens before he found a compatible donor who had the CCR5 mutation. I underwent total body irradiation to wipe out my body's immune system before receiving the transplant. I last took my HIV medications on the day of my stem cell transplant. The result, there was no detectable HIV in my system. My T cell count, counts increased, I thrived. I went to the gym. With HIV, I developed wasting syndrome. Without HIV, I developed muscles. I was looking good, I felt good. Until 2008, when my leukemia returned. Not, but not my HIV. Seven months after my stem cell transplant, being 100% off HIV medications, I was without detectable disease. Well, the HIV anyway. In February 2008, I underwent a second stem cell transplant from the same donor. My recovery from the second transplant was complicated. I became delirious and had to have a brain biopsy done. I have been left with some neuro neurological problems that require ongoing care. My life is far from perfect, but it's still my life. It is now more than five years after my stem cell transplant. I'm still without leukemia, but that's not the reason why you're listening to me today. It is because it is that after five years without HIV medications, I still have no trace of HIV in my body. I have been poked and biopsied from head to toe. Samples have been taken of, of my spinal fluid, anal mucosa, and any other place doctors can think of to stick a needle. <laughs> but no virus anyway, anywhere. To quote Dr. Uter in the December 2nd, 
2010 issue of the medical journal Blood, and he's talking about me. It is reasonable to conclude that cure of HIV infection has been, been achieved in this patient. After 30 years of dealing with a disease that has killed 30 million, actually that's 34 million, women, children, and men, somebody in the medical community said it. Said it. Hell, published it. Cure. Not in the it would be great one day sort of way. He meant today. Now I know that my treatment is not too bad about to become a commonplace um, procedure to cure HIV. It is dangerous, it is expensive, but my experience has shown that a cure is possible. After all, I am not an abstract concept. I know that we have not yet achieved our next phase of miracles with HIV, a readily available cure. But there are more researchers now willing now who are willing to focus on a cure rather than just treatment. My experience has also shown me <clears throat> the effect my experience has also shown me the benefits in, of an effective public health system and the synergy it can achieve working with academic medicine. I applaud those of you in the medical field for your dedication and hard work. I encourage you to continue to think outside the box. Remember that a former infectious disease patient is speaking to you today because an oncologist had an idea about treating HIV. For those burdened with cynicism or battle fatigue from their long fight against HIV, I hope that my experience brings a renewed optimism. As I finish, I would like to share my dream with you. My dream is not to be the man, be the man who stands before you and says, I am cured, but the man who stands before you and says, we are cured. I have selected the blue rose as a symbol for hope for the Timothy Ray Brown Foundation of the World AIDS Institute. The blue rose does not occur in nature and in alchemy. It, rep it represents the impossible made possible. The cure for HIV is my blue rose. When I received my HIV diagnosis in 1995, I fell, I fell to my knees. In 2007, when I was diagnosed as being cured, I fell to my knees again. But this time I prayed that one day the millions of people living with HIV and AIDS worldwide would receive their own blue rose. I will continue to dedicate my life, my blood, my body, my mind, and my soul toward this expedition to find the elusive blue rose. I will not let you down.